Hi, welcome to Come to Think of It, a program where we talk about things that matter. I'm Casey Scott, your host. My guest today is Roger Lockhart, an addictions counselor. We've been having a series of conversations on the nature of addiction. Roger, welcome back. Thanks, Casey. Now, um, when we concluded our last uh, session, we were talking about uh, love as the, the sort of the keystone of sobriety, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. And you identified three attributes of love. Uh, would you just mm -hmm. go mm -hmm. through those, uh, just, just to name them? Yep. Unconditional acceptance. All, all of them are unconditional. Mm -hmm. Embrace and celebration. Yes. Okay. So as I thought about that, mm -hmm. uh, it occurred to me that the essential nature of all that put together is, is a kind of humility. And um, because we're, we're going to be talking now, uh, well, we're, we're, we're moving in the direction of talking about the, the problem that is facing our, our, us as a species and mm -hmm. how that's related to uh, addictive process. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not, I think it's not too far a stretch to say that we as a species are uh, conspicuously lacking in humility. Well, certainly this cultural version of us is. Mm. I wouldn't uh, insist on that being the case um, over the whatever you want to, however we want to punctuate it, perhaps $2 million span, two, $2 million, $2 million <laughs> year span of our species. But I think it is uh, demonstrable from the archaeological record that because of our... Um, our great sort of advantages that we are invited into arrogance, into willfulness mm. uh, by the simple fact that we can get away with it. Mm. You know, here we were taking on the woolly mammoths and other creatures that uh, in and of themselves would, would appear to be, you know, far too formidable for us to mm -hmm contend with and, and taking them down because of our cleverness and gradually, uh, increasingly, our technological prowess. So uh, does that um, invite us away from humility? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, in that vein, I, I want to uh, introduce a, a document that, that uh, you wrote some years ago and it's titled, A Brief Comparison of Addictive and Sober Systems. And <coughs> before I get to this, I'd, I'd mm -hmm. like for you to tell us how this came about, because I think that's instructive. Mm -hmm. My last um, uh, employment working for an agency uh, back in the 80s, um, toward the end of my time there, uh, those of us who... Um, were invested in working on addiction and helping people get sober, uh, observed that there were a lot of qualities of how the agency itself was conducting its business, as it were, that, um, that had qualities of addictive consciousness, of addictive thinking and behavior and mm -hmm. so forth, uh, control-oriented, et cetera. And, and we undertook to very consciously address that and strive for what could be called systemic sobriety. And we were making some good headway. It was a very exciting uh, adventure. Um, and then there was a change of management and the new management was um, thoroughly unenthusiastic about our effort. Um, not merely non-supportive, but essentially antagonistic to it. So there was a brief um, uh, skirmish, if you will, where we still strove to realize sober um, concepts and of virtues mm -hmm. in, in the agency's makeup and, and conduct, and eventually, <coughs> excuse me, eventually lost out. <coughs> But during that interim of struggle, we're striving, <clears throat> uh, some of us began to notice that we were starting to resemble the very things that we were 
trying to turn away from. And so in an effort to help us sustain our consciousness in the directions that we understood to constitute sobriety, um, I made up this list of, okay, well, here's what an addictive sober, uh, addictive system tends to look like. Here's what a sober system tends to look like. And uh, because it was essentially kind of an in-group memo, it's um, almost unforgivably dense and compact. Yeah. I sometimes think of it as conceptual salami. Um, but it, uh, it has both the virtues and the handicaps of that kind of uh, compression. Mm. Well, I found in reading it that there were <coughs> there were certain passages of it that were that were very dense. And yeah, so <laughs> I had a little trouble following some of it, but in uh, in total, it's it's pretty straightforward and clear. Um, it says uh, starts off by saying that addictive systems are essentially political, investing in relationships of power and control, and sober systems are essentially ecological, investing in re invested in relationships of meaning and function. And um, th there are some examples here of, of uh, how that plays out. And uh, the, the sort of like um, opposites in, in a sense that the addictive system uh, will be righteous where the sober system will be appreciative and the addictive system is hierarchical, as you pointed out in your story, and the sober system symbiotic. Um, the addictive system is linear, or the sober system is recursive and resonant. And the, then there's uh, anti-intimacy, pro-intimacy -intim uh, contradiction, um, and um, boundary referential uh, as opposed to identity referential. These are all, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna go through that whole list, but, mm -hmm. but I, we, we sort of get the idea. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it kind of comes back to that notion of humility. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that, that uh, intrigued me about this was uh, that, you, that you mentioned that, um, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read a, a little bit of this. Um, let's see, oh, okay. While this presentation suggests an either-or dichotomy between the two systems, in fact, the sober ecological system is meta, the political system, in the sense that the relationships of power and control uh, are an integral part of the larger ecology. Conversely, uh, when the addictive technologies are working, uh, working, um, the, the addictive political description is meta, the ecological description, uh, and that, that, uh, that's kind of an interesting reversal. And um, one of the things that, that I thought of is um, the way we think, tend to think of ourselves as um, being in charge of our yeah. environment rather than participating mm -hmm. in it or putting it maybe a little more radically, being in charge of our lives mm -hmm. rather than participating in our lives. <clears throat> but let me, let me very pointedly underscore, uh, I know you, you follow it, but it is so uh, squeezed together, that on the second instance where I say that the um, the uh, addictive political system is uh, meta, what's, do those words again. The, it's, the, while the. Um, it's right at the very bottom. Yes, the. the um, right down here, I think. Oh yes, the, the addictive political description is meta, the ecological description. Mm -hmm. And the, that's, and the addictive. That's a description not of uh, the actual state of affairs, but of a misunderstanding. It, in other words, the, the, um, the reality is we are always contextual. Mm. But in our willful state, when, when we're thinking, when the, the political system is, in quotes, as you pointed out, meta the, um, the ecological uh, system, then 
we construe ourselves and we behave as though we are essentially in charge. Mm. And um, it works, as I, I think it, this section concludes, it works brilliantly until it doesn't. Yes. <laughs> and by then, of course, we're very much caught up in the, in the tangle of it. And it occurred to me as, as you were running down that, that, and you mentioned humility, which is very right on, that uh, another very simple way of heading those two columns, addictive and sober systems, would be willful and willing. Mm -hmm. And then each of those characteristics, those juxtaposed characteristics, would I think fall right into place. Mm -hmm. uh, willful, yep, got it. Willing. We, um, we started way back at the beginning talking about fulfillment of longings. Mm -hmm. And um, I just noticed in my own life that when I behave in, in a more sober, humble way, mm -hmm. I find a lot more fulfillment in my life than when I behave in a controlling, addictive way. Mm -hmm. Which is um, true over and over and over again, and it's so poignant because all of that willfulness is on behalf of fulfillment. Yes. Yeah. And what it tells us is there was a time, however long ago, when um, every indication was, yes, by golly, this is by far the most successful path to that fulfillment. Mm -hmm until accumulated experience shows yeah. us otherwise. A, 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 a de-evolution, if yeah. you will. Yeah. There was something I wanted to touch on just because we're making a, a noteworthy jump here from individual to systems. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to stop for a moment and say that um, it's not as absolute a jump as it might first appear because of the simple fact that we as individuals are in fact ourselves very complex ecologies made up of many different um, versions of self, both psychologically and emotionally, so that we can say, you know, I, mm -hmm. and five minutes later we can say I, and, and those are coming from two very different places both of which are legitimate aspects of self, uh, and both of which participate in a larger ecology of uh, self, and self-perception, um, uh, affective self, feeling self, uh, historical self, on and on. But in addition to that sort of psychological way of, of viewing the ecology of self as an organism, we are, we are an astonishing series of nested uh, entities down to the cells, which when I was a kid, we had a fairly simplistic little rendering of cells with a membrane and a few organelles, and uh, yeah, that's cool. Mm. Uh, next. Uh, but now, with the, you know, the, the modern understanding, there are in a typical cell in our makeup several hundred thousand entities that are busily conducting billions of operations per second. Mm. That's one cell yeah. that then participates in whatever organic system it's a part of and so forth. So I think it's really useful to, uh, to begin to construe us and to, to view ourselves in that systemic way so that as we step outside and propose, as, as we're doing here today, that, um, that there are other, other renderings of self that can have longings, that can choose, that can get seduced into the, the viewpoint and the strategies of addiction, and then go out into the world and um, uh, uh, misfortune uh, ensues. Mm. Yes, and it's not too, it's not, when, when viewed in that light, it's not too much of a stretch to go from that individual to the family, to the mm -hmm. community or tribe, to mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. to the, the um, culture, mm -hmm. to the species. 
Yeah, every every punctuation you can think of really. Corporate corporations can have um, uh, can and do. Mm. I would say I would argue that they can't not have some version of self. Yes. Um, healthy, unhealthy, whatever the characteristics are. We we saw that very recently as as we're taping in uh, here in the in the and very dramatically illustrated in the uh, market basket. Uh, oh yeah. Situation where. Um, employees actually went uh, essentially on strike mm -hmm. in support of a particular manager. CEO, right? Yes, yeah, CEO. Right. Which is which is a, basically they were they were opposing a a, a, a radical shift in the corporate self. <clears throat> well, you know, I haven't at all. Your, your point is totally well taken. I haven't. Um, prior to this conversation, thought to run down that list, but I would wager a tidy sum that um, one could find a, uh, a considerable correlation between the qualities in each of the columns, you know, the sober system uh, referring to the CEO who was so cherished and, and mm -hmm. uh, endorsed and embraced and the um, and the other family members, as I understand mm -hmm. it, who uh, ousted him and then came in with what seems to be very hierarchical, very uh, political, and uh, you know power and control based yes. yep. uh, epistemology. So yes, excellent yeah. example. Yeah, um, I'm also reminded that. Um, I believe it was George Bush who, who, if not originated, at least popularized the, the phrase that we, uh, as a society, are addicted to gasoline. To oil. Uh, to oil. Yeah. And I, I, yep. I suspect that he intended that, or thought he was speaking metaphorically, when in fact, not the case. Hmm. Well, certainly he, he didn't begin to appreciate the ramifications of what he said, and one of the things that's, uh, uh, and I don't know if you've noticed on my website, but there's a um, essay on there under the other writing section called Sobering America mm -hmm. uh, that was written around the time of uh, Bush's uh, assertion. <clears throat> but he goes on to say, we're addicted to oil that is in um, troubled parts of the world. Ah. And there's the problem. We need to uh, arrange for those parts of the world to not be troubled or to get the oil somewhere else or both. Mm -hmm. um, and I remarked in the essay something to the effect that that's a little like an alcoholic saying that my main problem is that the liquor store is in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> or too far away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, that reminds me of, of, of a, a, uh, in thinking about um, the ecological crisis that we face as a species, mm -hmm. that, that our first response is to look for a technological solution, mm -hmm. um, which it probably isn't going to get us where we want to go. Well, you know, nothing is going to get us where we want to go. That, um, or maybe more pointedly, get us out of where we don't want to go <laughs> um, that doesn't involve a fundamental change of consciousness because that's the essence of what um, is at stake in the addictive and sober consciousness uh, systems. It's, it's not a, uh, a position one arrives at analytically so much as a position that emerges out of a certain consciousness. And again, the language of willfulness and willingness is very evocative in your word, humility. Mm. And uh, the opposite of humility, which would be probably arrogance. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one of the things that I'd like to touch on before we leave this sheet behind, because it's, uh, this was drafted on, I think, 1987-ish. And um, I have only watched this 
uh, this aspect become more and more pronounced in our culture. And by our culture, it's a culture that by now is worldwide. So it's our culture in the species-wide sense mm -hmm. for the most part. And that is the part where I talk about how um, in, um, in addictive systems, because we, they become more and more absurd and, and meaning impoverished, um, that we settle for payoffs that are all about control and sensation appreciating that control and sensation are axes and that they're extremes of being in control and out of control. Mm -hmm. and, and with sensation, there are extremes of sensation and of lack of sensation or numbness. And if we look at our uh, recreations and uh, the things that, that uh, 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 soothe and excite us, more and more we see that, that these efforts at control, at um, sensation, at out of control, at numbness are manifesting in our culture in just greatly exaggerated ways. And, and I, we could have a whole program about that. Mm. Well, I think it's, I mean, it, it's, there's an interesting um, piece. This is also from, from your writings here. And, um, I just ask, like, ask you to read um, this section right here mm -hmm. um, because it, it, it kind of makes that point. Um, yeah, it does. You're right. Uh, our addictions to alcohol and other mood-altering drugs are only the tip of a massive iceberg. This is, of course, a cliché, but it is an apt one. Almost 90% of an iceberg is underwater invisible from our familiar surface perspective. Similarly, the vast presence of addiction becomes recognizable to us only as we learn how to look beneath the surface of commonplace human experience. Then we find that as individuals, we are addicted to all kinds of behaviors, feelings, and ways of thinking. And then there's a, there's a list, which I'm not sure which camera is alive right now, but <laughs> fills the rest of this page, gambling, sex, eating, television, movies, shopping, work, romance, caretaking, exercise, spectator sports, violence, passivity can be an addiction, anger, righteousness, neatness, chaos, the polarities, self-mutilation, -mutil self-beautification, isolation, making money, political and religious doctrines, risk-taking, lying, etc. Just basically anything that's on that, that, uh, that spectrum that you talk about, of um, control, out of control, well, and, sensation, yeah, any, uh, any potential and numbness. Agency of uh, management of our feeling and identity mm -hmm. states. And um, so, could you give us just a couple of examples of, of where you see that, that playing out um, in our culture? Um, it would be harder to think of examples where I don't see it playing out. <laughs> but uh, I don't watch much television. I haven't for uh, a very long time, uh, just because it sort of gets crowded out by other things. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I do, I, I probably watch sports more than anything else, not that I'm a big sports fan. But um, the sports themselves, of course, have escalated in, I believe, those dimensions uh, when I was young. There was, a, I would go so far as to say, a gentlemanly quality about football. Mm -hmm. um, and there was... Uh, anything that was a tenth in the direction of the kinds of dances and extravagant um, struts and so forth that are routine now and almost mm -hmm. expected 
with the football, with the basketball, other Especially places as basketball, well. Especially basketball, you see the evolution of that sport. Right, and then, and then the extreme uh, boxing, extreme fighting forms and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. It's, it's just, it escalates and escalates and escalates and, and we as consumers or, or uh, uh, consumers of these sensations, of these experiences become insatiable. We want more. And uh, even while sometimes there's another part of us saying, no, do I really want to watch this? Yes. <laughs> um, but as I say, I mean, it's, it's pretty much everywhere I turn mm. that, I mean, the cars are bigger, the lights are brighter, um, literally. Uh, we, we have to keep upping the ante. The warfare is endless. Oh, yes. Yes, that's a whole realm in itself. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Since you mentioned sports, I will say that that uh, I see a, a somewhat hopeful sign in that there's beginning to be a backlash in, in the in the area of football mm -hmm. in the public. Although, as best I'm aware, that's more in terms of a concern about injury rather than concern about the sensational mm -hmm. um, aspect. And if they can, f my my impression is, if they can find a way to avoid the in injury and up the drama, <laughs> that would be their ideal. Mm -hmm. you know, even more crashing, but nobody gets hurt. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so it, it, it raises the, the question now that, uh, that wh where do we cross over from simply enjoying something to this addiction, uh, this state of addiction with, mm -hmm. with the thing that was so enjoyable? Um. Mm. Well, um, where do we cross over? Um, I think it uh, serves us poorly to try to think in terms of there being some kind of a line that we cross over. Uh, I think that the, uh, the, the enticement of willfulness is uh, in us from very early on. Mm. I'm not quite prepared to say from birth. But I've met some, uh, you know, three-week-old babies that seem to be uh, trying it on for size. <laughs> <laughs> well, I raised the I raised the question uh, for the benefit of, of our viewing audience who, who might be sitting there saying, "You mean I can't watch sports anymore?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it's it, it's of course never as simple as that. Well, when I watch these sports, I can I can pay attention inside myself and I can in effect kind of meter, okay, how much of this is resonating on that level mm. of this is a fix? And the answer is typically quite a bit. Mm. Well, a good, a good uh, measuring stick and a good place for us to stop because we're out of time, Rose. Uh, <laughs> thank you for <laughs> thank coming you, Casey. again and uh, I'm sure we'll continue this discussion. And thank you for joining us on Come to Think of It. Hope you'll be with us next time. Until then, drive cheerfully. I'm Casey Scott.